In this section, we will focus on the major post-transcriptional modifications completed in the processing of prokaryotic and eukaryotic messenger RNA. Bacterial cells do not have extensive post-transcriptional modification of messenger RNA, primarily because transcription and translation are coupled processes. Bacterial cells lack the physical barrier of a nucleus, which allows transcription and translation machineries to function at the same time, enabling the concurrent translation of messenger RNA while it's being transcribed. Within this system, the NUS-G protein plays a critical role. NUS-G has three separate domains, two of which have known functions. The NUS-G N-terminal domain has the capacity to bind to RNA polymerase, whereas the C-terminal domain can interact with the NUS-E protein and with the ribosome, which is shown here in green. These two functions of NUS-G enable transcription to be coupled with translation. As soon as the RNA molecule is extending from the RNA polymerase, it can begin translation with the attachment of the ribosomes. The NUS-G protein can also interact with the Rho protein and help lead to the termination of transcription. In multicellular organisms, Almost every cell contains the same genome, yet complex spatial and temporal diversity is observed in gene transcripts. This is achieved through multiple levels of processing leading from gene to protein, of which RNA processing is an essential stage. Following the transcription of a gene by RNA polymerase to produce a primary messenger RNA transcript, Further processing is required to produce a stable and functional mature RNA product. This involves various processing steps, including RNA cleavage at specific sites that will remove intron sequences. This is called RNA splicing. In addition, other modifications include the addition of a 5' cap and the three prime polyadenylation tail. We will talk about all of these different modifications that will help produce the mature messenger RNA product. Polyadenylation is a required step for the correct termination of nearly all messenger RNA transcripts within eukaryotic organisms. In addition to determining the correct transcript length, the poly A tail helps to ensure the translocation of the nascent RNA molecule from the nucleus into the cytoplasm. The poly-A tail also helps to enhance translation efficiency and acts as a signal feature for RNA degradation. RNA cleavage and polyadenylation is carried out by a multi-subunit enzyme in which over 80 transacting proteins comprise a four core protein subcomplex. Polyadenylation signal sequences in the nascent messenger RNA initiate the cleavage and polyadenylation process, where approximately 50 to 100 adenosine residues are added to the messenger RNA. More than 70% of all genes harbor more than one polyadenylation signal this gives rise to transcript isoforms that can occur either within the same cell or within different cells depending on the transacting proteins that would be available to help with this cleavage and polyadenylation. Alternative polyadenylation signals that occur within the three prime untranslated region of the transcript can enable the resulting message to have different properties, such as differing stability, ability to localize in different places within the cell, and they may have different translation efficiencies. Internal polyadenylation signals, on the other hand, may have different functional or regulatory properties. In addition to polyadenylation, in eukaryotes, 
the messenger RNA also will typically be modified with a 5' prime cap. This 5' prime cap consists of a guanine nucleotide connected to the messenger RNA by an unusual 5' prime to 5' prime triphosphate linkage. This guanine residue is then methylated at the N7 position, forming a 7-methylguanate cap. This 7-methylguanate cap is the most common that occurs within eukaryotic system, but it's not the only one. But for our purposes, this will be the one that we will focus on. The capping process occurs through a capping enzyme complex that binds to the RNA polymerase 2 before transcription starts. As soon as the 5' prime end of the new transcript emerges from the RNA polymerase 2, the capping enzyme complex will carry out the capping process. The enzymes for capping can only bind to RNA polymerase 2 that is engaging in messenger RNA transcription. This ensures the specificity of the 7-methylguanate cap almost entirely to messenger RNA. The 5' prime cap has four main functions. It helps to regulate nuclear export of the messenger RNA from the nucleus into the cytoplasm. It helps to prevent the degradation of the messenger RNA by exonucleases, and it can help promote the translation process. It's also thought to have a role in aiding intron excision. You can see from this diagram that the process is quite complex. Both the poly A tail and the 5' prime cap are utilized to help translocate the messenger RNA from the nucleus into the cytoplasm. This takes place through the nuclear pore. With regard to the 7 methyl guanate cap, the CBC complex or cap binding complex is required for this translocation process. Here's a closer look at the process. CBC will bind to the 7 methylguanate cap and this will be recognized by the nuclear pore causing the export of the messenger RNA. Eukaryotic initiation factors will then bind with that cap region and they will interact with the ribosome and help the initiation of the translation process. We will look at this in more detail in chapter 11. In addition to aiding the translocation of the message, the 7 methylguanate cap also helps protect the messenger RNA from degradation. First, it functionally looks like the 3' prime end of the RNA and helps to evade the 5' prime degradation exonucleases. Secondly, when the 5' prime cap is bound with the initiation factors for the translation process, it hides the cap from the decapping enzymes and increases the lifespan of the message. Ultimately, decapping of the 7 methylguanate RNA is catalyzed by the decapping enzymes DCP1 and DCP2. These enzymes compete for binding of the 7-methylguanate cap with the initiation factors utilized for the translation process. The decapping enzymes can be aided by enhancers of the decapping enzymes, such as EDC3. These can bind to specific regions or sequences in the untranslated portion of the messenger RNA. So the sequences within this region can help control the lifespan of the messenger RNA molecule by aiding in decapping, which will expose the 5' prime end of the message to endonucleases that can mediate digestion. During the decay process, messenger RNAs may be sent to P bodies. P bodies are granular foci within the cytoplasm that contain high levels of exonuclease activity. In this final section, we'll take a detailed look at intron splicing. Eukaryotic organisms have large tracts of non-coding regions interspersed throughout gene sequences, known as intron sequences. These introns must be removed from the pre-messenger RNA before it translocates 
into the cytoplasm to undergo the translation process. Intron removal is mediated by the spliceosome, shown in this lower diagram. The spliceosome is a macromolecular complex formed by five small nuclear ribonucleoproteins, or SNRNPs. These are termed U1, U2, U4, U5, and U6. In addition to these five SNRNPs, there are approximately 200 additional proteins that are involved in this process. Only the SNRNPs are shown in this diagram. If we take a closer look at the pre-messenger RNA that needs to be spliced, we can see that there are some key sequence elements within the intron sequences that enable the SNRNP molecules to recognize the intron and choose the correct excision sites for splicing. Exon 1 is shown here in blue and exon 2 in gray. There is a key GU sequence at the 5' side of the splice site and a key AG sequence at the 3' side. These help identify the borders of the intron. There is also a polypyrimidine sequence located within the intron that is a key recognition sequence for SNRMP binding. There is also a branch point sequence labeled BPS that contains a critical adenine base that will be involved in the splicing reactions. The splicing reaction itself is a series of two transesterification reactions. So again, for the chemistry that will be occurring during the reaction, the key elements are the identification of the correct splicing sites and the branch point sequence that contains the critical adenine base. The first transesterification occurs from the positioning of the 2' hydroxyl of the branch point adenine near the 5' phosphate of the guanine residue at the 5' edge of the intron. The 2' hydroxyl will mediate nucleophilic attack on the 5' phosphate group of the guanine residue in the intron. You guessed it, this forms an oxyanion intermediate, and when the electrons rebound to reform the double bond between the phosphorus and the oxygen, exon 1 is going to serve as a leaving group. This forms the first intermediate product. The branch point adenosine residue is now covalently linked with the 5' edge of the intron sequence, and this is linked through the 2' hydroxyl. This has released the 3' hydroxyl of exon 1. This 3' hydroxyl is then positioned by the SNRMP molecules at the 5' position of exon 2. This hydroxyl will mediate nucleophilic attack at this phosphate residue, lead to the formation of the oxyanion intermediate, and the intron in this case will serve as the leaving group. The two exons will now be perfectly joined, and the final products are shown here. Exon 1 and exon 2 are joined, and the intron has been successfully spliced out. The branch point adenine residue remains covalently linked to the 5' phosphate of the intron. This resulting looped structure is known as the lariat structure. A lariat is a rope used by cowboys to lasso or tether animals, and this intron loop reminded scientists of that rope structure and why it has this name. So now let's go back to our original diagram and see how the small nuclear RNP molecules are involved in this process. In the first step, you can see that there are a number of small proteins involved in the recognition of the intron and that the U1 small nuclear RNP molecule recognizes and binds with the 5' edge of the exons. This will happen simultaneously for all of the 5' positions of each of the exons throughout the messenger RNA sequence. This is known as the commitment complex. Next, the U2 SNRNP will bind to the branch point sequence. This is known as complex A. 
Complex A is then converted into complex B with the binding of three additional small nuclear RNPs and the loss of the SF1 protein. U4, U5, and U6 will join the complex and cause the folding of the messenger RNA so that exon 1 will be in close proximity with exon 2. Sorry, there's no U3 SNRMP that's involved with this process. Researchers likely identified the SNRMP molecules before they knew their complete functions and found at the end that the U3 SNRMP is not involved. At this point, U1 and U4 will dissociate from the complex and U2, U5, and U6 will rearrange to form a catalytic core. This is complex B star and will quickly turn into the catalytic complex or complex C. This has some additional flexing of the active site to line up exon 1 with exon 2 for the transesterification reactions to occur. Once the two transesterifications have occurred, the U2, U5, and U6 complex will release the lariat structure of the intron and will release the messenger RNA with the intron successfully spliced out. Exon 1 is now joined with exon 2. Downstream introns would also be excised at this point as well if there were additional ones. The U2, U5, and U6 complexes can then be recycled to undergo another round of splicing. Alternative splicing offers an additional mechanism for regulating protein production and function. Alternative splicing options are determined by the expression or the exposure to in-trans elements that are present within the unique cellular locations and environments. Additional sequence elements within the messenger RNA known as exonic or intronic splicing silencers or enhancers shown in blue for the enhancer regions and in orange for the silencer regions will participate in the regulation of alternative splicing. Specific RNA binding proteins including heterogeneous nuclear ribonucleoproteins, or HNRNPs, and serine and arginine-rich proteins, or SR proteins, will recognize these sequences to positively or negatively regulate alternative splicing. These regulators, together with an ever-increasing number of additional auxiliary factors, provides the basis for the specificity of this pre-messenger RNA processing event in different cellular locations within the body. Thus, the splicing of any one gene is a very complicated process. There are several different types of alternative splicing events which can be classified into four main subgroups. The first type is exon skipping, which is the major type of alternative splicing event in higher eukaryotes. In this type of event, a cassette exon is removed from the pre-messenger RNA. In the second and third types of alternative splicing, these lead to events where the spliceosome recognizes two more splice sites at the end of one axon and may choose to retain part of an intron or part of an exon or fuse them in a different pattern. The fourth type is intron retention in which an intron remains in the mature messenger RNA transcript. This alternative splicing event is much more common in plants, fungi, and protozoa than it is in vertebrates. Other events that affect the transcript isoform outcome include mutually exclusive exons, alternative promoter usage, and alternative polyadenylation. Overall, there are many layers of RNA modifications that help to determine the coding region of the messenger RNA. They can also regulate the lifespan and the translation efficiency of the messenger RNA as well. So they help to regulate and control protein levels within a cell. In the next chapter, we will look in more depth at the translation process and see how protein activity and lifespan are affected at this stage.